Welcome, this is George Dello with Power for Today Prophetic Ministries coming to you from Toronto, Ohio with our uh, Tuesday night Bible study, first and third Tuesdays of each month. And uh, this, uh, this month we are talking about the uh, power of God's kingdom. And uh, before we get into the word tonight, we want to uh, have a word of prayer and ask God to uh, open the word to our understanding so that we can all uh, get a better revelation of God's word, especially when it concerns uh, our salvation and our life uh, before God. So join with me now as we uh, invoke the name of the Lord tonight. And uh, let's go to him in prayer right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we come to you tonight, uh, gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ, as we look into your word. Well, Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will come and lead us and guide us into all truth, that he will open the word to our understanding and our understanding to the word of God and uh, give us a, a complete revelation, Lord, to rightly divide the word of God. Father, I pray that for each one of us, you'll give us your spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that you would open the eyes of our understanding and enlighten us to your truth, that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the, glo of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of your power towards us. Father, I pray that... Uh, uh, your word, this gospel, will go forth, not in word only, but also in its own power and in the Holy Spirit and in great conviction and absolute certainty that all those who hear this word will receive it uh, as it is and welcome it uh, in truth, the word of God, which have works effectively in those who believe. We declare today, Lord, that we believe and therefore we receive, and we thank you, Lord, that word will produce the fruits of your kingdom in us, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, uh, the last couple of uh, uh, Bible studies, uh, first we looked into the reality of faith. And uh, all, of, all of these teachings are on uh, my Facebook page and also on YouTube. And uh, so you can, if you, have, if you didn't hear those, uh, you can go watch those videos uh, so you can have a better understanding of the things we're talking about now. Now, the last Bible study, we began this series on a Kingdom of Power. And uh, this is so essential in this day and hour that we're living in. Uh, because of the things that we are seeing going on around us, not only in our world, not only in our nations, in our culture, but in the church. And uh, I just want to uh, review one scripture from, from the last uh, Bible study, from Luke chapter uh, 13, and beginning in verse 23 through verse 27. And uh, because this is really key, and something that, uh, you know, we need God to open the eyes of his people to begin to, to see and understand these, these scriptures because, again, we are not seeing the reality of the kingdom of God in today's church. In uh, Luke 13, verse 23, one of them said to him, Jesus, Jesus was uh, uh, going through the cities and villages. He was teaching and, and, and heading towards Jerusalem. And as he was doing this, uh, some one came up to him and he said, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, this was Jesus' reply. He said, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. And then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and taught, uh, uh, and you taught in our streets. 
But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now, this is, this is something that we better get a hold of because Jesus is talking about life and death here. He's talking about spiritual life and death. And notice what he tells us when they asked him, uh, Will uh, only a few be saved? And notice Jesus' answer. He said, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, because many will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, Notice what he's saying here. He's talking about people that are seeking God. They are seeking heaven. They are seeking salvation. He's making it plain. He's, he's not talking to, uh, you know, the just total unbelievers and uh, apostates and people that, that have no desire for God. He's talking about people who are seeking God, seeking His salvation, seeking the kingdom of God. And Jesus is telling uh, this individual that the, the, the truth is, the reality is, many will seek Him. And now he's talking about these last days now. Many will seek Him, but only a few will actually get in to the kingdom of God. Now, that should be put a little bit of fear of God in all of our hearts, uh, because that's, that's pretty serious, that uh, many people in these last days will be seeking God, but not many will actually find the way into the kingdom of God. And uh, it's like the Proverbs tells us, I believe it's Proverbs 10, 22, he says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads to death. In, in other words, he's telling us that men have a lot of concepts and a lot of ideas about how to get into the kingdom of God, but most of them are wrong and they are not going to get them to the place they're trying to get to. And, and that's what Jesus is telling us here in Luke chapter 13. And he says again, once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, he's, what he's telling us here is there, there's, a, there's a cutoff. There's a day and a time when there is no more opportunity uh, to get into God's kingdom. That's why you can't just put things off and, and wait forever and, you know, well, you know, right before I die, or, you know, I'm just go out and, 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 and have, you know, a few more parties or something, or do what I want to do, uh, uh, and then I'll come. Jesus is telling us there's a shut-off, there's a cut-off time uh, when you will not have that opportunity anymore. And he says, once that door is shut, uh, that's it. There is, it's not going to be opened again. And if you're not in the kingdom, and you, you come, and Lord, you know, open up for us. You know, we, we, we know you. We you, you know, we, we, we've heard about you. We've even, uh, he even talks about those that were actually with him uh, when he was on this earth. But Jesus says, I don't know you. And you can't get into my kingdom. And notice the, the, the bottom line that he tells us, uh, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. And right there is the bottom line of what Jesus is telling us when it comes to getting into the kingdom of God. And this is why, again, we have got to get a revelation of this kingdom of power. Because the truth is this. Everything about God's kingdom is based on power. It's the power of the cross. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of God. It's the power of Jesus Christ. Everything about the kingdom of God and God's salvation is rooted. It is based in the power of God. Meaning this that it's not just some, you know, uh, uh, just say a prayer and everything's okay. It requires God's power to bring us into His kingdom because, again, you cannot bring sin into the kingdom of God. Gee, that's what Jesus was saying. Uh, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. If you think that you can profess Christ as your Savior and continue in a life of sin, you are sorely mistaken. Because you're going to find yourself on the other side of the door looking in, in that day when the door is shut. And this is a misconception throughout the body of Christ today. We, it's all through the church because of false teaching and this uh, concept of hyper grace and, and uh, once saved, always saved. And you go on and on with all these doctrines of demons uh, that are going to keep people out of the kingdom of God. We have got to understand 
the, the, that all through the New Testament, from the Gospels, through every letter of Paul, Peter, Jude, John, uh, I don't care where you look, are warnings. And the warnings are not to the lost. The warnings are to those that profess to know Christ. Every warning, just like Jesus talking here, he, he says the same thing he says in Luke 13, he tells in Matthew chapter 7. And in Matthew chapter 7, he, he even breaks it out, you know, like I just said in Luke, he said, uh, he's, he's talking to all of those that are seeking him, that are seeking the kingdom of God. In Matthew 7, he says, he, he makes it even plainer, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. In other words, what he is saying is, just because you call upon the name of the Lord, just because you profess to know Christ, if God's power hasn't changed you into a new creation and delivered you from the power of sin, you cannot get into the kingdom of God. And uh, we need to look at the reality of this kingdom, the reality of this gospel. Uh, because again, like he tells Matthew 7, <clears throat> they shall know you by your fruits. And go back to the video I was telling you about earlier, the reality of faith. The reality of faith. And you'll see that, that James explains it to us. Without works, faith is dead. It cannot save you. It cannot get you into the kingdom of God. If it does not produce a, a new creation in you, a new life, and set you free from sin, it is not real faith. So let's look at this in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 39. <clears throat> he talking about, Hebrews 11 is the, is the faith chapter. And it gives us a list of all the mighty men and women of God and uh, talking about Moses and David and Abraham and, uh, you know, all of these uh, people that live by faith, that please God. And in, in Hebrews 11, uh, at the very end of that chapter, after listing all of these uh, uh, people that uh, uh, were servants of God and lived a life of faith, he said, all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, in other words, God was pleased with them, their life of faith, and obedience to God uh, uh, re uh, brought them a testimony uh, from God Himself. But notice what He says. They did not receive the promise. What was the promise? The promise was eternal life. The promise was the coming of the Holy Spirit who brings that eternal life. They could not receive God's promise in their life. Okay, now uh, you have to understand this. In other words, when they died, they didn't go to heaven. They didn't go to be uh, with Jesus. Remember, Paul tells us uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, all of these people in Hebrews chapter 11, these mighty men and women of God of faith that had a testimony that pleased God, they could not just go into heaven when they died. They went into what we call paradise. They went into uh, 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 Hades. In the, the, it's called Abraham's bosom. And they had to wait uh, in that place until Jesus came and died and was resurrected and he fulfilled the work of the cross and took his blood into heaven. Only then, uh, and, and even then, Jesus went into Hades where they were and he preached to them and he brought them the, the, the completion of the truth that they were lacking uh, and uh, only then were they able uh, to fulfill the requirements of God for salvation and thereby when Jesus then took them into heaven with him so that he could be with them forever. But since the time of Jesus' cr the cross and the glorification of Christ, that's no longer true. We don't go into Hades when we die. We go straight to God. We're straight to the Lord uh, if we are truly born again, if we are truly redeemed by the blood of a lamb, we go straight into heaven when we die, our spirit, that is. Amen? So uh, he tells us the reason why uh, all of those people of faith couldn't get into heaven. He says, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So what is he saying? The reason that all of those mighty men and women of God, men of faith, I mean, please God, lived a life worthy of God, couldn't get into heaven. Why? Because they lacked, they could not be made perfect until Jesus did his work. And that word perfect literally means complete. They were missing something. 
uh, that uh, 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 would not allow them to receive eternal life at that time. And in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 1, he, he gives us a little idea about this. He says, for the law, why couldn't they get into heaven? Why couldn't they receive the promise of eternal life and the, the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in them? Because the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, the law uh, could not produce the reality or the completeness that was necessary for salvation. It was merely a shadow. It was a type of what would come through Jesus Christ. Something was lacking under the law uh, that could not produce a new creation, that could not deal with sin. So he says the law was just a shadow of good things to come. In other words, he was saying under the law, under the old covenant, they didn't have the means to make them complete, but it was a shadow, it was a type, and there was something coming. Good things were coming that would establish that completeness. And he says the law was, was a shadow, not the very image of those things. And here was the problem. They could never, with those sacrifices, which they offered continually year by year, all the blood of those animals, those bulls and goats and lambs, and, and, and all of those sacrifices they made year after year after year, for what? What was the purpose of a sacrifice? It was for sin. It was, it was to bring remission of sin. And he says, all those sacrifices that they offered could never make those who approach perfect or complete. Now, what did Hebrews chapter 11 just tell us? All of those uh, mighty men and women of God could not receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. Why? Because they could not be made perfect or complete. And notice the connection here. Why could they be made complete? Because the blood of bulls and lambs and goats, all those sacrifices they would made, could not take away their sin. All they could do was cover their sin. All they could do was, was uh, uh, be a means of, of keeping them until Jesus came and brought the real sacrifice who came as the Lamb of God to do what? take away the sin of the world. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't take the sin away. Jesus came to take the sin away in order to make us complete so that now we, and when we truly embrace the blood of Jesus Christ and His redemptive promises, His blood has the power, the reality of the power of God to do what? take away our sins and make us complete, perfect, or you could say make us holy, purify our sin, our, our hearts from all sin, so that now God can come and dwell in us and make us a new creation free from the power of sin so that we become a holy people that can receive the Holy Spirit and uh, 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 eternal life through Him. So that's why in Colossians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul tells us the law brought the shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Christ brought the substance. Christ brought the reality of everything that was foreshadowed in the law so that Rather than just having a form of godliness but lacking the power, rather than not being able to be made complete, perfect, and holy by the blood of bulls and animals and all those sacrifices that those priests made, Jesus came to bring the reality. He brought the substance so that those things can be actually produced in us by the power of God. So that, again, we are made complete and perfect. We become a new creation, free from sin, so that we can be a holy people and receive the Holy Spirit and be made uh, uh, in newness of life. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a kingdom of power. When we talk about the reality of this new covenant, the reality of this gospel. And that's what Jesus was talking about 
when he said, narrow is the way, not many, uh, uh, many will miss it, not only a few will find the way, because again, it requires us coming in to this revelation, and coming into the truth that sets us free, and um, uh, receiving the power of God that's going to bring about the complete redemptive work of Christ in a real and practical way, so that we become new creatures in the image of Jesus Christ. These passages that I'm showing you, they tell us the primary difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and uh, this New Covenant of grace that comes through Jesus Christ. The law did not have the ability, it did not have the power uh, to bring into reality the will and purpose of God for His people, which was and always will be to make us perfect or complete so that He might dwell inside of us by means of His Holy Spirit and therefore impart eternal life to us. In other words, make us partakers of His promise that He has given us from even before the foundation of the earth. That word perfect again in the Greek means complete. Everything is finished. Everything becomes reality through uh, Jesus Christ who brought the substance that we lack. The law could not complete God's work in us. So as you read these chapters of Hebrews, you're going to find that what it's referring to is the work of sanctification to make us holy. You shall be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. That is the only way into the kingdom of God. Nobody can get into the kingdom of God apart from true, practical holiness. And I'm telling you, that is the deception that is in the church today. It is the lie of the enemy. It is doctrines of demons which basically say we cannot be made holy in a real practical way uh, because they don't understand this gospel of power, this gospel of reality that Jesus came. They don't understand that uh, positional holiness is an old covenant, an Old Testament concept because they lack the means to make them practical, holy, practical, practically holy. And that's the reason, again, why God couldn't dwell in them, why He couldn't put the Holy Spirit inside of them, why they couldn't go straight to heaven when they die. It's all based on the lack of holiness. They had forgiveness. They had just uh, righteousness imputed to them. They had baptism. They had all of these things. You go back in the Old Testament, you'll, you'll find that they had everything to make them the children of God except practical holiness because the blood of bulls and goats could not take their sin away. So the whole covenant, the whole new covenant, the whole, this gospel of grace was brought to us. The purpose of the cross was to provide a sacrifice, to provide a blood that would bring the practical reality of holiness so we don't need another sacrifice. We don't have to go year after year after year uh, because He came to take our sin away. He brought a perfect remission of sins to deliver it from its power and its effect so that we could become the children of God. The Old Testament could only provide a shadow, a picture of what God wanted to do to bring us into real intimacy, into uh, uh, an abiding within us, us in Him and Him in us. Uh, it couldn't be done under the Old Covenant. It couldn't be done uh, 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 by the law. So Jesus came with this new covenant that is founded on better promises to fulfill what the law foreshadowed, to fulfill that picture that we're given in the Old Testament. Jesus brought the substance to make the shadow a reality. And we have got to understand this. We must understand this. When we read the Bible, in order to see with spiritual understanding the true gospel of Jesus Christ, in order that we might receive reality in our own lives. Without the reality, the only thing we have is a form of godliness which denies the power of God 
to make that godliness real. And I'm telling you, this is the greatest de de deception that has been perpetrated upon the body of Christ today because like Jesus said, many are on the wide way of destruction. Many will come seeking, come, come knocking on the door and Jesus says, I don't know you because you are lawless. You're still in sin. Many, he talks about, will not get into the kingdom of God. Many will be found lacking. Why? Because of this lie, this deception that has been brought by false preachers, false uh, 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 teachers, false prophets that God said would abound in the last days and uh, sin would abound in the church in the last days because they reject the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the cross, the power of the blood, the power of the gospel to make this work a reality uh, in us so that we can become a holy people in a real and practical way. Now, let's look at this. Let's look at this gospel, the reality of God's kingdom, as we walk through the gospels and see what Jesus was trying to come to do. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 25, it says, From that time, Jesus was getting near the end of his ministry. His time on earth was coming to a close. Remember, he began his ministry. It lasted for three years before he went to that cross to do what he came to do. So from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Okay? Okay. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. You have to understand, the disciples are just like all the rest of the Jews. They didn't understand uh, the, the, some of the prophecies of the Old Testament talking about their Savior would have to die for them. They didn't understand that. They thought Jesus was coming, the, the Savior, the Messiah would come as a king. He would come and just rule and destroy all their enemies and, and uh, restore the kingdom to, to the Jews and, and uh, everything would be done. But Jesus says, that's not the way it works. You have to understand the prophecies that were spoken concerning me. Jesus says, I've got to go to, the, to, to Jerusalem. I'm going there to suffer and to be killed, amen, and to be raised up on the third day. So he turns to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So Peter, uh, uh, we can see Jesus was telling us that Peter was speaking out of the flesh. He was speaking out of the, 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 the heart of Satan rather than the mind of God. And so he rebuked him, and notice what he did, he rebuked Satan, because Satan was the one influencing Peter to, to say those things, to bring a lie, to bring a deception. And so Jesus was correcting him, and he was showing us something that's very important here. When people are in the flesh, walking in disobedience contrary to the ways of God, it's because they're un under the influence of the prince of the power of the air. You can read that in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, read the first three verses and you'll see exactly what Jesus was talking about because again, you have to understand, these disciples until the cross were just like all the faith people, David and Abraham, they were not complete yet because Jesus had not gone to the cross to do what needed to be done. So they were still incomplete. They were still unholy. They were still uh, people of, of, of carnality and flesh. And that's why Satan was able to use Peter the way he did. They weren't born again yet. So again, we can see uh, uh, th this concept of uh, what Jesus came to do so that that wouldn't be in the New Testament church, in the New Covenant church. So Jesus said to his disciples, then Jesus said to his disciples, now, you got to see this. He is putting this right on the heels of what he just told his disciples and what he rebuked Peter about, okay? You got to see this. This is all the same passage flowing together. So Jesus said to his disciples, 
Okay? He just got through telling them, listen, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things from the elders, the priests, the scribes, and I'm going to be killed and raised up on the third day. Then he tells them, if anyone desires to come after me, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to follow me, remember what Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. My sheep, those that want to come into the kingdom of God, those that want to be saved, those that want to be my disciples, okay? If anyone desires to come after me, to follow me, let him, now look at this, he's telling us that we have to do, if we're going to be saved, if we're going to come into the kingdom of God as the true disciples of Jesus Christ, we have got to come the same way that Jesus came. What's he say? Number one, you must deny yourself. If you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself. What was Jesus doing when he went to Jerusalem and going to the cross? What was he doing? Denying himself. He says, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus had to put aside his will, his desire, his comfort, his, you know, whatever he, he had to forsake that and deny himself to do what? To do the will of the Father. He's telling us, if you're going to come after me, number one, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to lay down your will. You can't be like Peter and uh, uh, be mindful of the things of the flesh, the things for yourself, rather than the things of God. You've got to deny yourself for the things of God, for the will of God. So he says, and do what? And take up his cross and follow me. Now, there is an application of this taking up your cross on a daily basis once we're saved. But Jesus is making plain to us here that with a cross, the first, the first cross we have to take up is the same cross that Jesus had to take up. If we're going to come after him, we have to deny himself and we have to die with Christ. We have to be crucified with Christ so that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. Can you see that? Can you see what he's talking about? That's the only way to, to completion. That's the only way that we can follow Jesus, that we can come after him and follow him as his disciples. We've got to become like him by denying ourselves, going to the cross with Christ and be, being set free from our old life, that man of sin who is under the influence of Satan. For he says, look, and here he's making it very plain, that cross he's talking about. For whoever desires to save his life, if you want salvation, if you want to get into the kingdom of God, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you must lose your life. How do we lose our life? It's got to be crucified with Christ. It's got to go, it's got to be on the cross with Christ. That's what he's talking about. But whoever, for whoever loses, uh, whoever desires to save his life, in other words, if you want to do what you want to do, if you want to continue having your will, pleasing yourself, doing the things that you want to do, and speak the things like Peter uh, that he wanted to speak, and not be mindful of the things of God and the will of God, he says you will lose your life. He's talking about eternal damnation. He's talking about going to hell. He's talking about missing the kingdom of God. If you're going to try to save your life, do what you want to do, live the way you want to live, you're going to lose your life. But whoever loses his life for my sake, if you will give up your life on that cross, be crucified with Christ, embrace that work of the cross, guess what? You will find true life. You will find eternal life. Now, just connect that with what Jesus told us. Narrow is the way. <laughs> Narrow is the way. And few there be there that find it into the kingdom of God. Why? 
Because there's only one way into the kingdom of God. You have to go through the same thing that Jesus went through. You got to go to the cross and be killed, crucified on that cross with Christ so that you can be raised up just like Jesus in newness of life. A new creation who is righteous and holy by the blood of the Lamb. That's what it's all about. Amen. That's what it takes. Jesus came in the flesh for one reason. He came to do the will of the Father. Jesus was born to die. That's why he came. He was born to die. He came to give up his life as a living sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb that would replace all the bulls and goats and lambs of the old covenant. Jesus came to bring the perfect sacrifice, the complete sacrifice, the all-powerful sacrifice in order that what? That through that sacrifice, rather than having a form of godliness, we would have the reality of that godliness through the power of this gospel, the power of God in order to sanctify us, to make us holy in a real and practical way so that we may become the temples of God in us. That the Holy Spirit could come into this holy temple and dwell inside of us. Something that Abraham, Abraham could not have. David could not have. Uh, uh, none of them. None of those Old Testament saints. Joshua could not have. Moses could not have. God could not dwell in them. Why? They were not complete. They were not perfect. They were not holy. Their holiness was based on obeying the law. Their righteousness was based on obeying the law. They had a form, but not the reality. They had to wait until Jesus did his work. Well, he's done his work. He's come to bring the reality, to bring the substance. And now, when we do what God's called us to do, deny ourselves, allow ourselves to be crucified with Christ, and be raised up, be dead, buried, and raised up, amen, that work is made real in us. And Jesus showed us the way. He showed us the way by living it out himself. He then told us that we have to go the same way that he went. If we were to become his disciples, his sheep, his followers, those that would come after him and follow him, we had to go the same way that he went. We had to deny ourselves. We had to go to that cross. We had to give up our life, just like Jesus gave up his life for the will of the Father. Like Jesus, we too must be willing to forsake our own will for the will of the Father. We too have got to deny ourselves and go to the cross and die and give up our life to have His life. To have His life. Now, look at this in Matthew chapter 20, verse 21 to 23. Notice what Jesus said. He said to her, now this was the, the mother of, uh, of, of, of a couple of these disciples, what do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? Now what cup was he talking about? What cup was Jesus talking about? What did he say in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross? Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will. What cup was he talking about? The cup of death, the cup of the cross, the cup of laying down his life for the will of God. So he's saying, are you able? to drink the cup 
that I am about to drink. Okay, now remember, she asked him, let my son, let one sit on your right hand and one on your left in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, wait a minute now. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm getting ready to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Okay, now look what he says. They said to him, we are able. Now, she didn't know what she was talking about. They didn't know what they were talking about. They, they didn't really know what they were talking about right then. But look what Jesus said. So he said to them, now listen carefully. You will indeed drink my cup. What cup? The cup of death. If you're going to get into my kingdom, you have to drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. What baptism would de Jesus baptize with? The baptism of death. You must be baptized into death. When you understand this passage right here and put this together with these scriptures that I'm showing you, you'll begin to see what this gospel is really about. You'll begin to see uh, what Acts chapter 2 uh, Verse 38 and 39 is really about. You begin to understand what this baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire is really about. You'll begin to understand what I'm talking about when I say it is a kingdom of power, a gospel of power, a cross of power, a Jesus of power, a God of power. It is a kingdom. It is a, 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 a salvation of power. It regard, requires God's power to make us into a new creation. So he says, but to sit on my right hand, my left is not mine to give, but it's for those to, for whom it is prepared by my Father. But the point that we need to see, in order to follow Jesus, in order to come after him, we have to deny ourselves, give up our will, give up our plans, our purposes, give up our comfort, give up our life to drink the cup of Jesus, the cup of death, to be baptized into this death of Christ with him. To go to that cross, just as Jesus went to that cross, in order that we can be raised up in newness of life. And I'm telling you something, most of the church doesn't understand this, they don't believe it, and they haven't received it. And that's why we see so much sin and carnality in flesh in the church today, in the body of Christ, because they have not been made complete. They are still living under the old covenant. They are still living according to the law they have not come into the true redemptive work of Christ. And therefore, you do not see the fruits of a newness of life, the fruits of righteous and holiness being manifested. You do not see the obedience of the church doing the things that Jesus came to do upon this earth. And I'm telling you what, we better get, uh, get with it. We better get into the truth, seek the truth, get in the word of God to find the truth that will set us free or we will be found on the other side of the door knocking to get in and Jesus is going to tell us the same thing that he told them, the same thing he told those virgins, the same thing. He'll say, I do not know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You have, you're uh, still in your flesh and sin, and you cannot get in once the door is shut. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, look what Paul tells us about salvation. And you've got to read that whole passage in chapter 6, where, where Paul was dealing with the same issue, because even back then, in the days of Paul, there were those that did not truly understand this gospel. They thought that uh, when they came to Christ, they could just live a life of sin, do as they please, live how they want. And Paul says, if, do, 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 if you think that you can con uh, uh, continue in sin, you are sadly mistaken. And he tells them why. He tells them what should have happened when they are born again. He says, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. What did Jesus just tell the disciples? If you want to get into the kingdom of God, you have to be baptized with the same baptism that I was baptized with. It's the baptism of death. You got to drink the cup of death. Go to the cross. You must be buried with him through baptism into death. You can't be buried till you're dead. 
You don't bury something that's alive. You bury something that's dead. And the reason that you bury it is because you're going to leave it there. You're not going to bring it back. Okay? He says that just as Christ was raised from the dead, now look at this, by the glory, the power of the Father. He wasn't, it wasn't just, you, you know, it took God's power to raise him up from the dead the same way it takes God's power to raise us up from the dead. Even so, and here it is, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Remember what I told you, if you listened to the last video, remember I told you in 1 John 2, 6, he who says he abides in, Christ, in him, who abides in Christ, in other words, he who says he's born again, he who says he's been redeemed, he who says he is a disciple of Jesus, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Just as who walked? The same way Jesus walked is the way we are supposed to walk doing the same things that Jesus did, thinking and talking the same way Jesus did, doing the same works that Jesus did, and even greater works, he tells us, having the same character, the same nature, the same uh, holiness that Jesus had. If we claim to be in Christ, if we claim to be born again, if we claim to be a disciples of Christ, we should walk the same way Jesus walked. Why? Because we were supposed to have been buried with him through the baptism into death. We were dead on that cross with Christ. We died with Christ on that cross. We are crucified with him in order that what? The same power that raised up Christ from the dead would do what? Raise us up from the dead in newness of life. And what, that, what does that mean? That we walk in newness of life. We don't walk like Adam anymore. We don't walk like those uh, uh, in the flesh anymore. We don't walk in sin anymore. Why? Because we drink the cup. We, we were crucified with Christ. We, we were baptized into death by the Holy Spirit and fire. And what did he do when he baptized into death? He purified our hearts from all sin. He took our sin away. He washed us clean, sanctified us, and justified us in the name of Jesus by the Holy Spirit of God. It takes God's power, and that's the power of the kingdom he's talking about. Well, I see I'm running out of time. Uh, uh, I'm telling you, this, this right here has got to get out to the church because I'm telling you, there's a many, there's a whole lot of people that say, Lord, Lord, every Sunday. They profess to know him, but the reality is they do not walk like Jesus. They do not bear the fruits of a new creation. They do not do the will of God. They're still workers of iniquity, living in sin. And Jesus is going to tell them on that day, I don't know you you workers of lawlessness. God, help us. God, have mercy upon us. God, open the blinded eyes. Break through the darkness of understanding. Break through these doctrines of demons, false prophets, false teachers, false brethren, men that have crept in unawares into the church and are teaching a perversion of God's grace. They are teaching lasciviousness and covetousness and greediness and selfishness. God, help us. Help us to see the truth that will set us free and bring us into the fullness of your kingdom work. In Jesus' name. God, I pray right now, Lord, every person that watches this video, every person that's been hearing this, this word, Lord God, I pray that you will put it into their hearts and minds to get into the word of God. Go back, listen to these scriptures, read them for yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the revelation. And then make sure, test yourself, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Test yourself. See if you're really in the faith. Read 1 John uh, and see every time he talks about if you're really born again. Do you show the fruits? Do you show, do you have the evidence that you're born again by those things that are revealed in 1 John? 
And if not, I pray, get on your knees, go to the cross, get in the Word of God, get in prayer, and throw yourself at the feet of Jesus Christ and ask Him to do that work, to bring you to the end of yourself. Let the fear of God grip you until you are so crushed with godly sorrow of your sin that you are ready to turn from your sin, to forsake your sin, to embrace the cross of Christ, to surrender your life completely and totally to Him. And God will give you the truth. God will give you the gift of repentance. He'll give you the faith that will raise you up in the cross, in, in, in the newness of life to walk as Jesus walked as a new creation and a follower, disciple of Jesus Christ. God, I pray, let it be done in Jesus' name. I pray for those, oh God, that are sick, that are in, uh, uh, dealing with issues and problems. Right now, in Jesus' name, be healed. I release miracles, signs, and wonders into your life that God will meet your needs. He'll set you free, deliver you from all oppression of the enemy, that he will heal you, uh, work miracles in your body. In Jesus' name, be made whole in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that you follow your word with signs following, that your people will know that this is truth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I just want to uh, thank you for being with me today. This is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. I do these Bible studies on uh, the first and third Tuesdays each month, so I'll be back in two weeks to continue uh, talking about this kingdom of power. You can join me on Facebook Live. You can join me by phone. Uh, uh, I put out a notice on Facebook so you can see exactly how to do that and uh, uh, be back with us. Also, on Thursday nights, I'm doing a discipleship class, uh, 7 p.m. on Thursday nights, Facebook Live. You can join us uh, for discipleship class and uh, grow in, in, your, in your walk with God and hear some more truth. Amen. So God bless you and be with you. Uh, be encouraged and keep looking up because your redemption draws nigh. We love you and appreciate you. Uh, join us on Facebook or YouTube and you can see all the videos I got out there and uh, have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Amen.